So a couple of years ago, I was speaking at a music college and the professor and I, we were discussing, you know, music royalties with the students. And we were saying it's really interesting how it just so happens when your car breaks down or when your water softener goes out, a music royalty check just kind of seems to buzz on in. Music royalties and production music. What are they and why should composers care? Production music is music that is pre-made and pre-recorded and then licensed or sold for opportunities in film, television, radio, trailers, you name it. Now, when one of your tracks is licensed to accompany a film trailer or a television commercial or any other media for that matter, you get paid for that. That payment is a type of passive income we call a royalty. Now, while there are many different types of royalties, today we're gonna to focus on three major ones. Sync royalties, performance royalties, and download royalties. But before we get to those, why should you care about this? Guys, you should care about production music and music royalties because for a lot of composers and a lot of music creatives, this is gonna make up a huge portion of your income. Speaking for myself, last year, 40% of my total income came from passive sources like royalties. Anecdotally, another one of my colleagues claims that 50% of his total income is coming in the form of royalties and passive income. It's kind of important. So how do these incomes work? Let's get into the different types of royalties a little bit. So sync royalties. Sync royalties are just what they sound like. Each time one of your tracks that you have with a publisher or with a music catalog gets picked up for use, this is a payment that is made when the music is synchronized with the picture. It's kind of like a point of sale fee or like an initial license fee. Now, after that sync fee is paid and along and along we go, and you've been seeing your music on television next to an advertisement, you will receive a subsequent royalty payment, most of the time, depending upon the license agreement, that is called a performance royalty. What is a performance royalty and how does it work? A performance royalty is also basically exactly what it sounds like. Whenever your music is performed or broadcasted, it's a royalty that gets paid in exchange for that performance and for that use. Performance royalties are affected by a lot of different factors, some of which include the territory. I mean, how big of an area is it being broadcast in? The duration of the track, how much of the music is actually used? There's a lot of factors that affect performance royalties, but here's how they get reported. Performance royalties are reported and paid out by your PRO, or Performing Rights Organization. Here in the States, we recognize most widely ASCAP and BMI. Are there other PROs? Of course there are. But these are the ones that we tend to talk about most often here in the States. Now, when your music gets used on film, television, or other media, depending upon the license agreement, of course, it gets reported on what's called a cue sheet. That cue sheet is then sent to the PROs. The PROs collect royalty based on the data that is on those cue sheets. And subsequently, the PRO pays out the royalty to the composers and the artists that they represent. Performance royalties in a nutshell. The third type of royalty that we're going to talk about, which is going away somewhat on traditional models like iTunes, is the download royalty. Now, this is going to come into play more so when we talk about micro licensing, which we're going to get to in a moment. Now, how do these royalties get split up? In the traditional royalty model, there's usually what we call a writer-publisher split. Now, this is generally a 50-50 split, giving half of the money earned that goes to the composer and half of the money earned which goes to the publisher. Now, this can scoot a little bit, either favoring the publisher or the composer, but generally speaking, it's a 50-50 split. Now, what you're going to notice as you get more involved in this and as you have your first couple of checks start to come in is this is a little bit like investing and playing games in the musical stock market, so to speak. You're going to amass all of this music, which is kind of your creative catalog. It's your musical capital, so to speak. And you're going to go ahead and put that music in the market and kind of see how it does and hope for a return. Again, much like the stock market. But if history has taught us anything, it's that the stock market is many things. A sure thing is, is not one of them. 
but we still recognize it as something that's necessary to do things like plan for retirement, you know, have funds that are going to help us send our kids to school, things like that. Just as it's sort of a necessary risk for many, many people, so too is participating in a production music and music licensing market and relying on royalties. Again, if near half your income is coming in a form of that's a passive income like a royalty, it's safe to say you're depending on it, even though it's maybe not 100% a sure thing. However, even though it's not necessarily a sure thing per se, there are still things that we can do as composers to ensure that this risk that we're taking has the best possible chance of success. So the first thing that is most important to do if you want to be successful as a composer writing production music and you want to get paid those performance royalties and you want to make that sync royalty and you want to get those downloads, the first thing and most important thing you should do is work with reputable publishers. So reputable publishers, what do I mean by that? In my personal experience, that has meant one of two things. Either A, they're paying you outright for that music. They're buying the music and they're buying the rights to collect on that music, at least oftentimes the sync royalties, but they're paying you outright. They're putting their money where their mouth is and they're saying, we're buying this music, but here is money for your creative output. The second sign of a reputable publisher is their influence and throw and track record in the industry. You guys, if, if they're getting lots of film trailer placements, if you have seen and heard their music on television and they've got a really long track record of doing really well, if you've spoken with their artists, that's likely a reputable publisher. And even though they might not pay you up front, maybe they're letting you collect half of the sync revenue. Again, their track record hopefully will speak for itself. So you found a reputable publisher that you wanna work with. What is the next step? When you actually start writing your music, you guys, you want to write simple music. Oftentimes, in my experience, simple music performs the best. I mean, I'll write this beautiful, gorgeous track with counter melodies and percussion and complex rhythms, and I think it's the best thing in the world, but it doesn't always perform that well. As composers, we like to flex our musical muscles and write really cool music. But sometimes, especially if you're competing with a voiceover or just trying to support a visual, simple is best. Number three for writing successful production music and hopefully being successful in royalties is to create as many useful versions of a track that you write as possible. So alternate versions, what does that mean? Maybe that means bed versions, like no melodies. Maybe that means like underscore versions with no percussion. Maybe it means like 30 or 60 second versions. Basically what you're doing is you're throwing more chum into the water for the sharks to hopefully grab onto and eat. You're going to have a better chance of your track getting licensed if someone looking for a track is, you know, looking through a catalog and they say, oh man, I love that track, but I really wish they had a no percussion version. Look at that. And then they pick it up. It's just going to increase the chances that one of your tracks is going to get picked in this game of lottery that is production music. Number four, find your creative niche. A lot of publishers and music catalogs reach out to composers because they know they're really good at a certain style of music. The other reason you want to find your creative niche is if you're writing a lot in one style and you're able to put more of that music into that genre of the production music industry, you're going to have a larger share and a larger stake in that style of music as far as the production music pie goes. So the more cinematic music you write, the more rock music that you write, the more sort of corporate safe music that you write. If you have a larger share of that genre in circulation in the market, when someone's looking for that kind of track, you're going to have a better chance of having one of your tracks get used. And again, as publishers begin to reach out to you because you write that style of music, if it's a style of music that you enjoy writing, you're going to spend more time writing a genre that you enjoy. Five, beware exclusive track deals for your music, you guys. Exclusive deals, if you're working with a reputable publisher, either that's paying you up front or that has an outstanding track record, in my experience, that hasn't necessarily been bad. But where I have gotten into trouble is signing an exclusive deal with a catalog that I don't know very well or signing an agreement with a party that has unfortunately underperformed. I mean, they haven't gotten a lot of licenses for my music, but I'm stuck in an exclusive deal. I can't take my music out until the term ends. What you want to do is be careful about of exclusive deals. They're not inherently bad, but exclusive deals entered in for the wrong reasons or with the wrong publisher can be really painful learning experiences. Number six, never, ever, ever give away the writer's share of your performance royalties. 
even if a company that is hiring you to do production music gives you an upfront fee, that is likely to collect the sync royalties. You should never give away your composer's share. There are also publishers that will say, you know, we were we were quite involved in the writing process. We think we should get some of the uh, composer's share of the performance royalties as well. Uh-uh, walk away. And finally, number seven, be patient, you guys. This is a long game. If you're working with a domestic publisher that is publishing in your country, you can expect, at least here in the States, to wait 12 months from the time that you hand off your music to the time when you get that first royalty check. It takes time. If you're working in foreign markets and you have a publisher that sub-publishes in other countries, you can wait anywhere from two to three years to get your first performance royalty check. Again, patience is a virtue here. So we kind of understand the traditional royalty model now, and it's in a very simple sense we understand it. It goes even deeper than that. But there's a new kid on the block in the form of micro-licensing. And it's not so much new as it's just gaining more prevalence and space in the industry right now. Micro-licensing is essentially high volumes of licenses, lots of individual licenses for lower fees, maybe even cents on the dollar. So whereas the traditional publishing model, you're probably going to get fewer licenses for a higher fee, you're going to get a lot more licenses for a much lower fee in the micro-licensing model. Now, this music also goes by another name, which makes people a little uncomfortable, and that term is royalty-free music. The unfortunate thing about this label is that it's not wholly accurate. Composers and music producers are still getting paid for this music, you guys. And just as a means of illustrating and kind of contrasting these two models, let's take a deeper look, shall we? Now, in the traditional royalty model, there's a bit of a food chain. Sub-publishers pay publishers, publishers pay their composers and their catalog contributors. Now, in this model, let's say you're working with a really large, well-known publisher. Now, by the time we get down this food chain, you can expect maybe $10 per license. Now, let's say that track that we're discussing right now for an example, that $10 license, let's say it licenses a hundred times. A hundred times 10 is a thousand dollars in sync fees. Now, rule of thumb, again, rule of thumb, not perfect, but we'll use it for this example. That is generally going to be half of what you're going to get in total from your performance royalties. So $1,000 in sync fees, plus a thousand dollars in performance royalties, $2,000 for that track of production music. And that's actually, that that's pretty good. Now, on the micro-licensing side, let's say every time one of your tracks gets downloaded, you get a 50 cent royalty. But it's likely that track is going to get licensed thousands of times. So let's say you get 4,000 downloads on a 50 cent license. That's going to equal $2,000. The point of this model, as you can see, is not to illustrate that one is better than the other, it's just to show you how the distribution models work. So as we stated at the beginning of this video, it's no surprise that this idea of the micro-licensing model, or as some people call it, royalty-free music, it's no surprise that that makes people a little nervous, composers and publishers included, especially given the fact that so much of our income is coming from passive sources like performance royalties. But anecdotally, this is what I can say, not advocating for either one model. What I can say is that there are plenty of my colleagues that are doing just fine in both of those models. The other thing to keep in mind is that traditionally both models, at least at the time that this video is being recorded, are servicing different portions of the market. In the micro-licensing model, we've got folks like wedding videographers, independent film producers, weekend hobbyists, these are the folks that don't have several hundred dollars or even several thousands of dollars to spend on a piece of music in their projects. Whereas Fortune 500 companies that participate maybe more so in a traditional publishing model, they have thousands and thousands of dollars to throw at a piece of ad music. So does it mean that there's not some Fortune 500 companies getting a piece of micro-licensed music? Or that maybe even a wedding videographer working for a wealthy client isn't licensing a well-known artist track for their wedding video? Of course it doesn't. Of course there's going to be crossover. But there is something of an unofficial line in the sand that both of these different markets are servicing different clients. So we've very loosely and very briefly defined what royalties are and how production music generally works. But the question you're probably asking yourself as a composer now, if you're not participating in this portion of the industry, is how do I get involved? Now, I really don't want to disappoint anyone watching this that has been watching to the end of how do I get involved, but unfortunately, there's no easy answer for this. Production music, 
like a lot of other sectors of our business, are highly saturated and highly competitive. But don't lose hope. That doesn't mean that you don't have any chances whatsoever for writing production music and earning royalties. What it does mean is that you're going to have to get savvy with doing outreach, shaking hands, and meeting people. If it's helpful, I'm going to post a link in the description where I talk about internships and starting conversations with composers. I give some good tips in that video about how to perhaps attend industry events or send polite cold emails and start the process of reaching out to folks in our industry that you're hoping to meet and chat with. So what is your favorite piece of production music that you've written? I would love to hear the music you guys have been writing. Feel free to post a link in the description to an awesome piece of trailer music, a happy-go-lucky ad cue, or even just a nasty cool rock track that's meant to be production music. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you can be notified every time that I release a new video. Until we talk again, stay safe, write lots of music, and be well.